Good morning and welcome to yet another session of the NPTEL course, Indian Fiction in English. Today's lecture is titled Postcoloniality and its Challenges. And we hope to be able to ask a few questions, rather enable you to ask a few questions related to the newer kinds of postcolonialities which are challenging the framework of Indian fiction in English itself. Let me take back you to a time, the early 1980s, specifically 1981, when Midnight's Children was first published. In the British magazine Granta, an excerpt from Midnight's Children was published and Bill Bufford, who wrote about the this new kind of fiction was emerging. He had situated Midnight's Children not as an Indian novel, but more like a work which was produced within the British milieu. And this is what Bufford wrote, situating Rushdi largely as a British writer. The fiction of today is testimony to an invasion of outsiders using a language much larger than culture. Today, however, the imagination resides along the peripheries. It is spoken through a minority discourse, where the dominant tongue reappropriated, recommanded, and importantly, reinvigorated. It is at last the end of the English novel and the beginning of the British one. So the way he had uh, signposted Midnight's Children was as a British novel, a novel which inaugurated a new phase in British literary tradition. Because conveniently in the Rushdi moment, there was a dovetailing of the colonial past and also as often immigrant present. But much later, we know how Midnight Children became a watershed event and how it changed the scene of writing, not in Britain, but in India and how a new kind of postcoloniality was introduced in terms of Indian fiction written in English. In that context, after 17 years in 1997, when Bill Bufford was writing in another issue of Granta, this was after the success of uh, Midnight Children was cemented and after Rushdi became uh, introduced as this inaugurator of this new moment. Listen to what uh, Bufford had to say then. What is happening among Indian writers must be unprecedented. He was referring to a range of new writers which uh, were writing then, the post 1980s, the post 90s. Uh, Vikram Chandrani Tadesai, Kiran Desai, uh, Adrshir Vakil, Amitav Kosh, Rohintan Mestri, Arun Thadi Roy Vrikram Seth, Amit Chaudhary, it is a long list. So, referring to them in 1997, Bill Bufford writes again. What is happening among Indian writers must be unprecedented. They work, some of them in an adopted language and often in isolation, even thousands of miles from their homeland. But he did not, of course, he did not invoke the earlier center periphery thing in the context of postcolonialism or in the context of situating Midnight's Children as a text produced within the British milieu. He did not talk about the end of the English novel and the birth of the British novel. Of course, he did not talk about the South Asian societies, the local communities which were discussed in these novels either. It is in this context that I want to draw your attention to postcoloniality and its many challenges, especially when we are talking about the multiple frameworks within Indian fiction is currently situated. We have gone through a range of discussions throughout this course. We have identified a number of dichotomies from the beginning of the discussion which we started uh, incidentally again with Salman Rushdie and his uh, controversial introduction to vintage, vintage book of Indian writing. He spoke about these dichotomies which separated Pasha from English, the increasing uh, the widening gap between the regional and national or international literatures, the rural urban divide, the ways in which the regional writers identified this land as their home and how focusing an audience abroad or situating oneself in one of those locales abroad is not seen as authentic enough as far as Indian writers in English are concerned about the dichotomies between the colonial and the post-colonial, about how we find it difficult to negotiate the dialogue between commercial and literary fiction. So there are multiple dichotomies that we had been paying attention to and we also had discussed how one needs to break past some of these uh, uh, redundant frameworks and some of these rather delimiting frameworks. The changing paradigms in the current scenario, just like Bill Bufford also noticed a shift in the way Midnight's children gets positioned, these changing paradigms are perhaps the way ahead giving us newer perspectives and newer orientation as far as studies related to Indian fiction in English are concerned. 
So, we talk about a new context, an emergent post-colonial situation where we need to be attentive to the various ways in which the Indian English writers are also affirming their loyalty to Bhasha words. They are no longer exes a dichotomy but rather a dialogue perhaps is beginning to emerge. There is a wide world of translation which is opening up, we know about the number of new anthologies which are coming out where the works translated into English are also considered as part of the larger oeuvre of Indian writing in English. And we also find a growing interest, a, a diverse interest of publishing houses where they have almost uh, begun to not differentiate between the tree and uh, commercial fiction, where they are they're more inclusive about uh, non-canonical works as well. And we are reminded uh, increasingly that English is becoming less of a colonial remnant and more of an Indian language. So, in these contexts with these shifting paradigms, we also need to address the questions that are, we also need to re-ask the questions that are framed in the context of Indian writing in English. Let me remind you of an earlier discussion where we pointed out that Minakshi Mukherjee had asserted the importance of looking at the story of Indian English fiction as a genre fashioned by complex cultural determinants. It, it cannot be a purely literary exercise. So, throughout this course, we had been looking at these various determinants, these various complex cultural determinants which were coming together to shape the story of Indian uh, English fiction. We looked at canonical and non-canonical works. We looked at the different uh, critical sources, the different uh, secondary material which are also aiding the understanding and also even the dissemination of uh, uh, fiction which is uh, produced. We spoke about the growing influence of the market and how a globalized society has given a different kind of an accent and import to Indian fiction in English. We spoke about the role played by various kinds of awards in placing uh, works within uh, different contexts and different uh, institutions. So, it is a complex cultural history also which emerges when we look at the story of Indian English fiction. In the post 1990s, of course, taking on going on with the momentum uh, gained in the 1980s, we find that there is an alternate tradition which also begins to emerge. We find an increasing number of translations, works produced from different regions, from different languages being incorporated into this large corpus, into this large oeuvre of Indian writing in English. Sharmila Rege talks about the foregrounding of the betrayers of the nation and how the 90s make it possible to talk about gender, talk about caste. We had briefly spoken about the Dalit writing which is uh, coming uh, in, into the foray. Uh, uh, for instance, works such as Bhimayana, a uh, graphic novel which challenges the existing conventions in terms of form, in terms of uh, narration, in terms of content as well. And there are a number of works by Dalit writers which are getting translated into English. We also spoke about how the Dalits see increasingly see English as a more liberating language than any of the other Indian languages. Truth Tales is a series of anthology published by Kali for Women, uh, now uh, Zuban, and they their objective was to highlight what lies outside the framework of Indo-Anglian writing. And they found a wealth of literature in the regional languages that represented some of the most dynamic trends in Indian writing that had little exposure beyond its region. So, we find the region also becoming a major discourse, a major determinant, a major uh, locus in these uh, uh, new discussions in the context of Indian writing in English. And uh, in the context of writing the nation, uh, we find the writings by women challenging the current understanding of the nation and questioning the understanding uh, of the nation and Taru and Nalita in their celebrated work, Women Writing in India. They argue that it is important to create a platform, a create a context in which women's writing can be read. There are these multiple alternate things which are happening simultaneously. Uh, Eunice D'Souza's anthology, it claimed to challenge standard histories and truth tales, another edition, another uh, uh, volume of truth tales, it identified itself as a site of potential rupture. And of course, we have new publishing houses such as Leftwar, Navayana, Zuban, uh, Samya, Stri, Tuliga. They are all celebrating how minorities claim 
their writing space in the world. So there are multiple things happening simultaneously in the post 90s. It's not just Rushdie's children and it's not just the Ghosh generation which is dominating the 90s. We need to be attentive to how we would reframe the discourse of Indian fiction in English given that these newer changes, that the, these uh, uh, newer trends are also reorienting the paradigm. Here I briefly draw your attention to the need for alternate frameworks from particularly two major points of view, from caste and also from gender. The old conservative approach towards Indian writing in English, for example, sees that as a casteless space. Uh, well, one of the articles by uh, Makran Paranjpe, which appeared in 1991, it's right after the bundle event. Uh, he wrote an article in APW where he argued, it may appear that Brahmins have dominated the Indian English novel. What these novels have in common is that they are all de brahminized to sum up Indian English novel as a casteless upper caste. It sparked off a series of debates between uh, Makran Paranjpe and uh, uh, Satya Narayana. This, is, this was featured in the EPW of 1991. And Satya Narayana, on the other hand, he began to refute the arguments put forward by Paranjpe, rather the claim put forward by Paranjpe that Indian English fiction is a casteless space. Satya Narayana countered it by saying, Paranjpe's historical burden is to demonstrate that the dominance of the Brahmins in the authorship of Indian English fiction is not dominated by caste. His article is a part of the anti mandal discourse that suddenly discovered class out of nothing. So these are some of the instances which we can use rather fruitfully and, and constructively to open up avenues for alternate frameworks. And when we talk about gender, John Mee in his survey essay about the works which came out after midnight, that's how John Mee's essay is titled. Uh, this 1998 essay categorically stated that male writers drawn into reimagining the nation on an epic scale, they rewrite the national history and to rewrite the national history is itself the expression of a privilege to which Indian women do not easily gain access. And Neelam Srivastava's 2007 work which identifies a direct connection between secularism and Indian novel in English. She also identified this as a genre for narrating India and instantly she only chose to discuss male writers. And we do find very effective counters from Josna Irege's 2003 essay which we had briefly taken a look at in the context of our discussion on Midnight's Children and uh, Marwa's 2008 essay titled Edited Out. Reggae argues, women who have attempted to employ the na narrative of nation find themselves condemned to rehearse a story that excludes them. Minorities and women writers who have found that the exclusive discourse of the nation cannot be made to tell their story have been less likely to employ the narrative of the nation. Marwa is both direct in her attack, the audacity with which Rashti claims his space in the world perhaps makes him an unsuitable ancestor for Indian women's writing. So in these alternate frameworks, the absence of caste, the exclusion of uh, women's writing, these are some of the things that uh, they begin to address. So we need to be attentive to the newer ways in which we can begin to unpack the story of Indian writing in English and to go beyond the common sense which has been built into it, to rethink the paradigms and to examine the hidden assumptions which have been part of uh, this uh, critical tradition. We did take a look at some of the essays which had begun to do that and I do think that these exercises will give a more inclusive uh, image for uh, Indian writing in English. For this lecture I particularly find Rashmi Satana's 2012 work English Heart Hindi Heartland The Political Life of Literature in India useful and uh, she talks about a dichotomy between English and Hindi. She also places it within a peculiar milieu where it is difficult to see that as two different disparate things. What she proposes to do in this book is to bring together writers who are otherwise uh, poles apart for instance. She brings together writers, the Indian English writers such as uh, uh, Rashti, Khor, Seth, uh, Anita Desai etc. and the Bhasha writers such as K. Sachidanandan. Uh, the ones who write in both languages such as Kiran Nagarkar. She brings together all of them together to participate in a central debate about language, about context, about the different ways in which they are all seen as Indian writers from in one critical tradition or the other. She begins her book by narrating an anecdote of the pavement bookseller 
and that also sets the context for her work. She talks about how she encountered a pavement bookseller in Delhi and how he uh, and how he claims that she he has only best sellers for sale. I read this excerpt out for you. I ask a pavement bookseller what he has for sale and he replies only best sellers. I have little interest in best sellers but that's about to change. What makes a book a best seller? I ask matter of factly. He points to difficult daughters, the first novel by the Delhi based writer Manju Kapoor. To me this novel is serious literary fiction and I am happy to hear that it is also selling well. She further talks about these uh, differences between literary and non-literary uh, fiction and comes back to the pavement bookseller. She had asked what makes this a bestseller, what makes Manju Kapoor's Difficult Daughters a bestseller because she was curious to know the version of this uh, bookseller boy. The pavement bookseller explains to me in Hindi that when Amitabh Bachchan asked who the author of Difficult Daughters was, as a trivia question on Kaun Banega Kurodpati, who wants to be a millionaire, the novel started to sell. What became a bestseller certainly also had to do with the perennial bestseller status of the Bachchan brand. If the Big B was mentioning the novel and asking who its author was, surely it was worth knowing who she was and perhaps even buying what she had written. So this is the complex postcoloniality within which Rashmi Sadhana situates her discussion. And this is a postcoloniality that we also need to be attentive to when we are talking about Indian fiction in English in the contemporary. And uh, further, Sadhana points out the pavement boy who is selling the books. She may well be represented in the books that he sells, but he probably won't ever read them. And this is an important point to be noted. In another earlier essay, Gauri Vishwanathan talks about how there is this young girl who wants to learn English so that she can live in the houses that she is now helping to build. She belongs to the working class and she sees English language as this passport to success. We have come across a number of discussions which do refer to English language as this uh, uh, vehicle towards uh, modernity, towards a better lifestyle, towards a radically new kind of exposure. So coming back to Sadhana, what she uh, probably wants to focus is on this disjuncture between the language on the ground of daily life, of literary representation. And this, she argues, is relevant to the place and role of Indian fiction in English. And this, uh, uh, and this kind of a disjuncture which we can begin to notice in the works written in English, in the practice of English, in the daily use of English, this uh, disjuncture is indicative of a larger schism in Indian society. And unless one is attentive to these various formations, these uh, different configurations, it would not be possible to do a more relevant contemporary reading of Indian fiction in English. So the question that we need to ask now is whether the postcolonial framework that we currently employ is adequate enough to capture all the challenges and prospect of Indian fiction written in English and more importantly what are at stake here. To answer this question I draw your attention to three instances which Rashmi Sadhana also discusses in her book in different uh, contexts. The first one is Meenakshi Mukherjee's suspicion of the increasing number of translations from regional languages to English. The second is an instance where Arunthadi Roy talks about her writing in English for a predominantly non-English speaking milieu. And the third is a much discussed instance which we also had referred to in one of the earlier sessions. It is Amitabh Kaur's withdrawal of his book from the competition for Commonwealth Prize. So how do these three instances play a significant role in rewriting the paradigms and changing the ways in which Indian English fiction can be read? I'm not necessarily saying that these, these three instances had magically rewritten the postcolonial framework, but I do believe that these three instances can indicate some of the changes which have already come about or some of the changes which are imminent. These would serve as indicators for us to change and refine and redefine the current paradigms. First we briefly talk about Minakshi Mukherjee's discomfort with the increasing number of translations from uh, other Indian languages to English. Of course they offer a new possibility which she does not dismiss but she also worries that this would be another instance when English is privileged as the language of cultural transmission. If you are familiar with the many discussions within the context of world literature, this is also something that 
the uh, critics try to deal with and uh, engage with that the translations are being made primarily into English. English becomes the only mediating language. This is all the more relevant in a discussion of Indian literature written in different languages including English. There is a power imbalance that Minakshi Mukherjee begins to identify between English and the Pashas and English emerges as the only mediating language. One would know whether there are productive strategies to counter this, but given the fact that Minakshi Mukherjee was one earlier critic who had to legitimize her critical interest in Indo-Anglian fiction when she started focusing on this area in the 1970s, given that fact that she herself becomes concerned about English being transformed into a language of cultural transmission. Rather, the presence of English as a language of cultural transmission gets further legitimized. That uh, comes across as a matter of concern for her. What perhaps she is trying to tell us that the newer translations, of course, they do highlight the possibility of uh, uh, newer dialogues emerging between English and Pashas, but at the same time, it also has inherent within it a further restrictive, a counterproductive thing. The second instance is Kosh's refusal. Kosh uh, refused to participate in a uh, competition for a Commonwealth Writers Prize. He argued that uh, uh, his publisher had uh, uh, entered his name, submitted his name without his knowledge. Commonwealth Writers Prize, by the way, was instituted in 1987. It was administered by the Commonwealth Foundation. Uh, it's an intergovernmental organization based in London. It represents 46 Commonwealth nation. The member states, uh, were, uh, most of them were at some point part of the British colonial empire. In this context, Kosh refusal can be seen as a political statement. Why did Kosh refuse to be a part of this prize? He argued that it was an outdated, hierarchical and imperial mapping of the world. In the detailed letter that was uh, now published also very widely, he further stated that it ignored the literatures of non-English writers who formed the majorities of these post-colonial societies. And thirdly, he had a problem with the term itself, Commonwealth. The historical inflection of the term Commonwealth, Kosh further stated that it speaks only of the brute facts of time. Uh, read colonial domination rather than a more nuanced uh, view of how people, nations and societies have developed over time. Let me also briefly remind you what we discussed at the outset of this uh, lecture about Bill Bufford first situating Midnight Children within the British milieu, identifying that as a shift away from English novel towards British novel and then 17 years later identifying the many different ways in which Indian writers are writing in English, but still refusing to acknowledge, refusing to deal with the societies that are being written about. This was celebrated as an important moment. It also further helped people to identify Kosh and Rushdi. Rushdi had written an essay, Commonwealth Literature Does Not Exist, a 1983 essay, which we shall be looking at uh, in the final session. Uh, Rushdi also had disapproved the, this sort of a pigeonholing of writers. These are important moments where in writing in English is trying to assert itself in a new post-colonial way. The language cannot be seen as a remnant of the colonial rule in the same way. The tradition also need not be seen as a remnant of the colonial critical practices of the English literary practices. The third instance is Roy's own reference, Aruntadi Roy's own reference to her changing English. She wrote, I have spent the last six months travelling across the country, speaking at huge meetings in smaller towns, Ranchi, Jalandhar, Bhubaneswar, Jaipur, Srinagar, at public meetings with massive audiences, three and four thousand people, students, farmers, labourers, activists. I speak mostly in Hindi, which is in my language. Even that has to be translated depending on where the meeting is being held. Though I write in English, my writing is immediately translated into Hindi, Telugu, Kannada, Tamil, Bengali, Malayalam, Odia. I don't think I am considered an Indo-Anglian writer anymore. I seem to be drifting away from the English speaking world at high speed. My English must be changing. The way I think about language certainly is. Roy has so far written only two pieces of fiction that also has uh, enjoyed a permanent reputation for her as far as Indian fiction English is concerned as far as the international audience also is concerned. But this is an important moment where she identifies herself 
more as someone who is catering to a non-English speaking public. He identifies her use of language as something which would make meaning, which would uh, aid the process of change. It also refers to the kind of activism that she is involved in. So, language becomes, assumes a different role altogether and not just a medium which she would use for her fiction. And this move away from the English speaking world is also to be noted. Uh, Rashmi Sidhana's argument is that Roy's language is imbricated with place and social activism. And this uh, assertion, this uh, rather this confession from Roy, it also reiterates that the locus of authenticity is in small towns, not just the place, but the causes, the people yeah, and the, the have nots as far as English language is concerned. And in Sadhana's own words, it becomes necessary to assert one's loyalty and affirm one's politics of location, whether or not it is the actual ground on which one stands. When we move out of the body of writing, which is conventionally understood as Indian fiction in English, when we move out of the fictional work of Roy and begin to engage with the ways in which she begins to redefine her own use of language and her own locus of authenticity, we begin to see a newer way in which not just Roy's fiction, but this entire world can be read and reread. Minakshi Mukherjee's uh, suspicion towards the increasing number of translations to English, Coe's refusal of the Commonwealth Prize, and Arundhati Roy identifying the ways in which her own language, her use of language is changing. These three instances could be signposted as moments which would perhaps further aid the process of reinventing the study of uh, Indian English fiction, of uh, challenging the borders and also uh, redefining the boundaries, the conventions, the disciplinary frameworks within which it is being currently thought about and taught. Drawing towards the final segment of this lecture, I draw your attention to the porous boundaries which we need to be further attentive to. If you take two novels which Sadhana does towards the end of her discussion, English August by Women New Chatterjee and Five Point Someone by Chetan Bhagat, both were best selling works uh, on their own rights though they are largely situated in two different categories. English August is seen as a literary work as a part of the canon, Five Point Someone is seen as a you know, bestseller, a pulsating uh, narrative, it is a bestseller but it is commercial fiction. English August published in 1988. Uh, and Five Point Someone uh, published in 2004. They both largely and very loosely focus on protagonists who are urban, who are college aged, who smoke pot, they are also male. But there are certain differences which makes it difficult for them to sit conveniently together within the same category. English August is situated firmly in an ironic pre liberalization India, but Five Point Someone projects a comic post liberalization zone. Of course, that was also one of the reasons why it endeared it itself to the urban uh, youth. English August was also critically placed within the bureaucratic haze. But five points someone, it talks about a uh, uh, neoliberal India where these uh, the youth are working at call centers, they are negotiating corporate salaries, they are inhabiting certain sites which would further accentuate their access to these new worlds with possibilities. Um, and in uh, both these uh, works, English August and Five Point Someone, they both were uh, made into films. The film version of English August in which uh, Rahul Bose also starred, it had toured the world, it won awards, but it did not really resonate with the masses. Five Point Someone was made into Three Idiots, it was widely popular, uh, it was um, Amir Khan had starred in it and it was also declared as the biggest hit of 2009. So, there are certain similarities, but there are certain obvious differences which makes it inconvenient for us to look at both with the same lens and though written in English, though written by Indians, we do not conveniently see both of them as part of a canon of Indian writing in English. One as pointed out before is literary and can be included, the other is commercial fiction. Rashmi Sadhana in this very brief discussion, she makes a further distinction. In English August, the character Agastya, who is also nicknamed as August. Uh, for August, his English credentials remind him of how out of touch he is with the rest of India. And on the other hand, in Bhagat's novel, on the uh, contrary, we find that his 
characters have a changing relationship with the English. It uh, tells us about how more urban youth are in touch with the kind of English than ever before. How these new Englishes are giving a new consciousness about social mobility itself. The point which Rashmi Siddhana wishes to pursue further is that there are two different ways in which English language gets situated in these two different novels which belong to different categories. But unless one is attentive to both these segments, unless one is attentive to the porous boundaries that exist between these two and more open to break down the barriers which do not allow us to look at both within the framework of Indian writing in English, uh, perhaps we will continue to remain in a straight jacketed post-colonial reading of Indian writing in English. And in Sadhana's own words, this awareness, this awareness of these porous boundaries does not take census numbers away from the Pashas, but in fact creates more porous boundaries between languages and the thoughts and ideas contained in them. As also pointed out in one of the earlier uh, sections, it's not really about whether Rushdi, Khosh, uh, um, Roy, Seth, etc. are the only canonical figures. It's not really about whether Chetan Bhagat deserves to be in the canon or not, but it is about these larger questions, about the porous boundaries which are being presented to us and it's up to us to make a good use of them. As we wrap this lecture, I want to leave you with this quote from Annette Coloni. Her essay published in 1988, The Integrity of Memory, Creating a New Literary History of the United States, it spoke about a propitious moment. This is how the introduction to the essay reads and I feel that in this introduction, we can look at many avenues which we can use to our own advantage in rewriting the critical tradition and history of Indian writing in English. I read to you from Annette Colonit's essay. This is the uh, introductory paragraph. It is a propitious moment to be rewriting the literary history of the United States. Two decades of unprecedented scholarship and criticism have excavated lost authors for a reconsideration, delineated literary traditions of which we had been previously unaware, and raised probing questions about the very processes by which we canonize, valorize, and select the text to be remembered. In the wake of all the new information about the literary production of women, blacks, Native Americans, ethnic minorities, and gays and lesbians, and with new ways of analyzing popular fiction, non-canonical genres, and working class writings, all prior literary histories are rendered partial, inadequate, and obsolete. It's a very powerful statement. And we do have to agree that Indian literature, the history of Indian literature, has begun to address this propitious moment. We know about literary histories being rewritten. We know about lost authors, forgotten writers being brought to the foray. We know about how the literary traditions are being uh, reconsidered. We know about the difficult, challenging questions that are being asked about the processes by which we canonize or valorize. And we also know about the new information which is being used to reprocess the literary histories of various Indian uh, literatures produced in different languages from different regions. But whether this propitious moment has arrived in the field of Indian fiction in English is the right question, is the adequate question to ask now. Unless these new questions are asked, unless this moment is reckoned with in an adequate fashion, as Coloni reminds us, the prior literary histories are rendered partial, inadequate and obsolete. So unless we deal with this propitious moment, Indian fiction in English as a category also faces this risk of being rendered partial, inadequate or obsolete. I thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you in the next session which also happens to be the final lecture.